So we have the privilege to sit down uh, with Susan Eisenhower, who is the uh, granddaughter of President Eisenhower and general, of course. And uh, your father also um, was in the military. He was. He graduated on D-Day from did. West Point. Yes. So uh, that was probably a challenge for him because I'm guessing he probably wasn't allowed in combat, was he? Um, he, no, he, he well he went to um, he went to Europe. Mm -hmm. He was uh, in a in a unit. No, I think the the bigger uh, and I, I can't actually give you an evaluation of how close they were to the front, but he um, you know he was there in a regular unit. Mm -hmm. um, the real question was what happened to him during uh, the presidency, because the president of the United States is the commander in chief, mm -hmm. and then the issue becomes. Um, since you have the ultimate power over what happens um, on, you know, your own, uh, with your own forces, uh, a president would have to make certain, you know, big mm. calls. And um, when my father came back from Korea um, and attended the inauguration, they had to have a very serious little talk. And my grandfather said, you know, you can never be captured. Yeah. And, uh, and so I would suggest that you, you know, don't return. And my father said, you know, I, I can't be an army officer and not report for duty. He mm. says, I understand, but you'll have to take, you'll have to take measures. You yeah, know? yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit, I know, because when we all study uh, President Eisenhower, we're studying his military service, we're studying his presidency, but just for you personally, what was he like as a grandpa? Oh, he's very engaged. Yeah? Yeah, he's very engaged, and he got a big kick out of things, and he'd come to... He came to my sister's ballet recitals. He came to some of my horse shows. Uh, he turned up for my brother's baseball games, and I think it was somewhat disruptive. But mm -hmm. he, no, but he was very interested in that. Mm -hmm. They were very engaged, and in some ways, they were a little bit more like grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, less like grandparents and more like something else that doesn't have a name. Because uh, when you get into um, families like this, where um, you know, the sense of power that surrounds mm. the person does distort some relationships. So yeah. these families tend to be very dependent on each other. Mm. And what, how did your grandmother deal with not only his status as a Supreme Allied Commander in Europe during World War II, but then the presidency? How did she deal with all of that? Oh, very well. I mean, she, she was a natural. And she's very down to earth, too. So people, I mean, she was a big asset on the campaign trail. Mm. Um, but. You know, I think, um, first of all, she'd been raised in a, a family that, um, you know, had all of the etiquette training and everything else. Mm -hmm. I think she went to finishing school. Oh, yeah. um, and so uh, she would have known how to handle herself in all those environments. But, you know, like any other career, it doesn't start at the top. And mm -hmm. you work your way up and you learn how to adapt to different environments. But mm -hmm. she was a natural. And um, they were, you know, uh, remarkable as a team. Yeah. So my son, who's with us here, my son Eli, is a big fan of the space race and the history oh, of space okay. and all that. And of course, that all really began under your grandfather's presidency. That's so right. uh, he's coming into, so yeah. we can see he's Hi. in the shot. Good. So yeah, NASA started when your grandfather was president. And that's right. So can you tell me, because I know that's something that you have a lot of interest in and have written about, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about your, your, your grandfather's role in NASA and the early part of the space race. Well, I mean, um, Eli, can you imagine what it'd be like to be the first president when some really major change like this occurred? So nobody had ever put anything into space. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting moment because nobody really knew what the rules of yeah. space were. So those rules had to be worked out. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of thought given mm -hmm. to how to make sure that space would be a free commons for the entire international community. But that wasn't clear in the beginning. Yeah, and, and even, it, even things like what kind of a person is going to be an astronaut. You right, know? Yeah. All, of the, all of those Very things. specific. Yeah. Very specific. And we're what? from Ohio, so we love there our we astronauts yeah, in yeah, Ohio. John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, Jim Lovell, all those guys. Right, so what, is, what interests you most about space? <laughs> you know, you know a lot about the planets and the stars, and you're, yeah. you're excited about us going to Mars one of these days. Well, I'm I'm very excited about the about space itself too. Yeah. Have you ever? Do you ever see IMAX movies? 
Well, we saw one here in Gettysburg, but yeah, you, you haven't too There's often. There's an IMAX movie on the Hubble Space Ooh. Telescope, oh. which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, go back over there and make sure everything is looking good, okay? <laughs> um, and then uh, just another question I had for you with all this was, as you've studied your grandfather's life, has there been anything that you have learned that has surprised you or maybe caused you to, to see him differently than maybe you did in your childhood? I'm not, I'm not going to say that I've been surprised by anything because I've been a professional in a field that he, he dominated. Mm. Um, but um, in, in my research, I think I was, um, everything I knew about him was, was made sharper. Mm. And, um, and, you know, it was very emotional to write yeah. because I realized how much self-sacrifice went into mm. what he did. And I know, and in the research, I knew better why he did certain things. Um, I mean, why he decided to run for president. He didn't have to. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, his, his reputation was already well established. Mm -hmm. So it was a risky thing to do. But, you know, so how many people would risk being at the absolute top for... Um, and, and the danger there, as it is today, was whether or not he'd get the nomination. Mm. I think it was pretty clear that he'd probably be elected if he got that nomination. Mm -hmm. But, the, um, but the, you know, the partisanship is a completely different yeah. uh, dimension of a life that had already been lived in, the military, in military service. Yeah. Has there ever been a situation where you've seen an article or a book that someone has read or an interview where somebody has said something that's just really, you don't have to name specifics, but just really upset you because you just felt like they, they don't know the man at all. Well, I think, first of all, I, I alluded to it in my talk today, but, um, you know, it was not okay for others to um, uh, blame the administration before mm. for their own mistakes. And I, I think that we have a tendency to do that today. And so I rather like the Let's take full responsibility mm -hmm. uh, for this. Um, and um, I don't know. It's it's a it's a very um, it's a very difficult um, question to answer in a lot of ways. But I think um, sometimes what I see is just a a way of looking at this from the person's point of view without thinking about how it would look from his point of view. Mm -hmm. So if I can give you an example. Um, one scholar um, thought that, said that some of the things he'd done was cowardly. Mm. And then I read the set of circumstances and I thought, boy, you didn't sit at the same dining room table I did as a kid because I can explain <laughs> this to you. And it was a case of um, when uh, Governor Sherman Adams uh, retired as, or what, resigned from being chief of staff. Mm. And there was uh, some scandal involved. Um, a friend, a longtime friend of Adams had given him a coat and a few other gifts. Um, but there was nothing illegal about what Adams did. It's just that the optics were bad and the Eisenhower administration was trying to, uh, be, uh, to be in fact and obvious to the American people that the highest standards were being mm -hmm. implemented. So the question was, um, should the president you know, have a conversation with him or fire him or something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or have a conversation with him directly. And Eisenhower actually sent Richard Nixon and Meet Alcorn, who was the head of the Republican Party, to have lunch with him. Mm -hmm. And this, this writer said, well, that was a cowardly thing. Uh, he obviously didn't want to have any confrontation. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> uh, Eisenhower was fully capable of having conversation. Oh, yeah. uh, you don't get to where, where he was no, without right. having those conversations. But here's the thing. He didn't want to corner somebody who had devoted so much mm. of his service uh, to the American people. And he wanted to give um, Sherman Adams the opportunity to do the right thing. Mm. And at the end of the lunch, Sherman Adams was a smart man. He, you know, he knew why lunch was being assembled, mm. but it gave him the opportunity to come in and say to the president, you know, I've been thinking about this and I'd like to resign. So he went out of his way to avoid mm. humiliating right, right. Governor Adams. Now that's, it's a, it's a slightly longer way to get to the same thing, but you know, there, um, especially since he hadn't broken the law, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
And I, I just think that there was something very special yeah, about that. It, but, but quite, this, so it's hard to hear someone call that well, a cowardly situation. Well, you know, I just situation. thought you're missing an opportunity to um, invite other people to think about another way to handle this. Yeah. But we used to get the don't ever corner anybody mm -hmm. uh, lecture at the dining room table. <laughs> oh, we did. And, I, you know, I used to say to my own kids, if you bring your little friend up and ask if they can spend the night, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm confronted with saying yes or no in front of this, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you come up and ask me, and I either then I have the freedom to say right. yeah. say Right, yeah, big difference. No, no cornering here, please, right. no. So last question then, it relates to that one, because uh, I know this is something that you, my you viewers... You can edit it. <laughs> uh, I, well, no, 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 that's totally fine. Um, I know my viewers will want to know about this. What can you give us, as far as insight goes, into your grandfather's relationship with George Patton? Oh, I th well, they were longtime friends. Yeah, you know, they right. had been um, friends since 1920s, mm -hmm. 22 uh, onwards. And, you know, you can never take away that long-term um, friendship. And, of course, you know, Patton um, had so much talent mm -hmm. and was really important for what he did. And so that put uh, the Supreme Commander in some awkward situations uh, more than once. Um, but, you know, warfare is comprised of all kinds of things. It's mm -hmm. not just um, military success. In order to enjoy that success, you have to have high morale and you have to have certain standards being right. demonstrated by um, the generals themselves. Um, so I think that, uh, that represented some of the, um, a few of the difficult times mm -hmm. during. And do you think that that's one of the reasons why your grandfather was given the position he was, is because he, he was good at handling those he's, delicate he's, situations you know, like I that? I think that's very observant of you. He was really very good at handling delicate situations. And I will say something that's going to sound wild. Um, I took the writing of my book very much to heart, and I have actually become a better professional than I was before because I've slowed down a little bit on the way I react to mm -hmm. things and because I'm thinking all right hang on you just you just told a bunch of people that you know they might consider this now you better consider it yourself <laughs> right <laughs> so um, you know I, I learned a lot yeah. from what I read but you know he I think the other thing that was striking for me in my youth is, I mean, I knew all of his associates who were still alive mm -hmm. when I came to Washington, and they all were devoted to him. Yeah. And it's hard to do that, you know, when everybody's under a lot of pressure, yeah. unless the top person is being quieter and more deliberate and, mm -hmm. you know, taking the time to, you know, uh, keep crucial relationships alive and to um, give other people a chance to shine, too. Yeah. So Susan Eisenhower, thank you so much for sitting down with us. And I'm going to put links down in the description so you guys can um, see some of her books and some of her work. And you can get your hands on it yourself, including the one that my son and I just got. Uh, How Ike Led the Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. So check that out. Thank you so much for sitting thank down you. with us. Thank you. A pleasure.